Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, I watched uh, the Top Gear video. A little colder. I'm wearing my Mike Tyson Christmas sweater. Because it was the closest sweater nearby. Or jumper, as you guys would say. So, uh, Plan Red. Britain and America's planned wars on each other. I know this because of Hearts of Iron. Um, so, yeah. Brits. We got a problem. <laughs> so, I find it interesting how us to World War I is about the same amount of time from World War I to, like, the War of 1812, where us and the Brits were very much enemies. And it, it's easy to, it's really hard to think about that after, you know, a, a century of really closeness. And you can never, like, see us fighting each other, but... Even go back a hundred years ago, and our friendship really drops. And so, this isn't as surprising, but I think you guys have yet to uh, compensate for the damage you did to the White House. Let's go. My name's Connor. Hello. I like to have fun. I like to watch things. Original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord. Click on it. Love to have you. Send you right over there. Preemptive like. Let's go. If you are not ready to learn, the United States and Great there's... Britain were the closest of allies during most of the 20th century. They fought together in two world wars and acted as the cornerstones of the post war NATO alliance. However, for a time in the 1920s and 30s, things were not so rosy. For a time, the militaries of both nations even prepared for open conflict between them. Wait a second, I thought this was more of like a late 1800s thing. This is in the 20s and 30s. The impact of the First World War had changed relations between Britain and America in some ways that were likely to increase tension between them. First, it left the UK owing a huge war debt to the United States, $22 billion at a time when their entire GDP was just $26 billion. So is that like a few trillion dollars today? Secondly, it removed Germany as a global naval power, when its mighty battle fleet was interned at Scarpa Flow and then broken up. With the Germans out of the picture, the United States became the world's second naval power behind Britain, which potentially made her Britain's primary rival for control of the sea. This newfound naval strength was recognised in 1921, when the British agreed to parity with the Americans in capital ships at the Washington Naval Conference. Unlike with Germany's naval challenge earlier in the century, the British government had little desire for another costly naval arms race, and was determined to see the United States as a partner, not an enemy. When the Admiralty recommended in June 1919 that an officer be tasked with drawing up contingency plans for war with the US, the British cabinet refused. Prime Minister David Lloyd George was keen not to allow the Navy to use the newly powerful American fleet as justification to increase the size of its own. This decision irritated some within the Navy who thought that war was possible so long as America's commercial influence across the world continued to grow. Deputy Chief of the Naval Staff, Vice it Admiral won't. Sir Osmond Brock, argued that because of Britain's track record of fighting those who threatened its commercial dominance, I am quite ready to allow that a war with the United States is very improbable, but that it is impossible, I cannot allow. Can I say one thing? There's something amazing about language, a common language that makes you feel more close to another country. Like, um, you know, there's, you know, Mexico and, and, you know, Central American countries right next to us, and yet I, I feel like I would relate more to an Australia or New Zealand than I would many Central American countries, simply, I believe, because of the fact that it, there's a language barrier there. And it, it's crazy just the British were able to, to dominate so much, and then the places they dominated ended up speaking the same language they did. And so they have like a, they might not have the the complete empire that they used to back in the day, but I think that that empire building is still paying dividends in the fact that you have these powerful countries that speak the same language and so empathize with you more. Does that make sense? If I'm wrong, 
As for how such a war would happen, the concern from a British perspective was not that the US might simply wake up one day and declare war on Britain, but that the two nations might accidentally stumble into hostilities in a dispute over trade, for example. Suppose that Britain was involved in a war against another nation, which the US traded with. Under what Britain termed its belligerent rights, she would claim the ability to stop and search neutral merchant ships and seize any goods which it was believed was heading for the enemy country. During World War I, the exercise of these dubiously legal rights had irritated the USA considerably, and let's suppose that the same was true in this hypothetical war. Only this time, the US, feeling confident with its navy at parity with the UK now, decides to escort its merchant ships to and from Britain's enemy and force its trade through. This would give the British a huge problem, since cutting overseas trade to a hostile nation was extremely important to any war plan it drew up against any major power. If the US took action to undermine this, it's likely the Royal Navy would feel it had no option but to use force to protect its belligerent rights and thus slip into a war against the United States without really meaning to. This is the scenario which some in the Royal Navy foresaw. Admiral Sir Roger Keyes, commander of the Mediterranean Fleet, told Winston Churchill in 1927, If we are ever at war with American neutral and the American fleet sets out in convoys to force her trade, I pray that the government of the day will have the nerve to allow the British fleet to deal with the situation. American officers too were not blind to the possibility of a war with Britain, even though they too had no desire for one to take place. One difference between the two nations' attitudes though is that the Americans thought it feasible, perhaps even natural, that Britain would declare war on them to protect her commercial position at the top of the tree. As far as the Americans were concerned, argues Christopher Bell, Britain had always used its navy in a ruthless and calculated manner to protect and further its trade, and would continue to do so. Just as the British had attacked Copenhagen in 1807 to protect its trade through the Baltic, it seemed possible that they would do just the same to the US if they got the chance. So with this in mind, in 1930 the United States Army and Navy devised War Plan Red, a comprehensive plan for a war with Britain and her dominions. The central focus for Plan Red was Canada, which it was thought would be firmly on Britain's side in any conflict. The worst case scenario for the US was- what, What's going on with this island? That's not Vancouver Island. That Who owns this? Like the Nike swoosh looking. Considered to be a rapid and massive build up of troops and ships in Canada for an invasion south. It was forecast that within 40 days of war being declared, Britain could have a fleet of 14 battleships and 5 aircraft carriers established at Halifax. It projected 345,000 troops could be mustered in Canada within 6 months, with reinforcements from across the empire eventually taking the total up to 2.5 million men. Clearly, to allow such a force to assemble would be incredibly dangerous, and so Plan Red recommended attacks into Canada to capture major cities and especially the port of Halifax, to deny the British a suitable naval and supply base on the Atlantic North American coast. So guys, so, so back then, uh, the US is a much, much, much less powerful nation. They're, they're still powerful, but they're not as powerful. And uh, would you agree that at, at this time, Great Britain is the more economically and militarily advanced nation here? And so, right? At this time? Other attacks would capture there Quebec, Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg and Vancouver, aiming to overrun Canada in a very short space of time. Opposing the US drive north would be the small Canadian army of 95,000 men. The US thought these troops would attempt to hold Halifax in a line around Montreal and Quebec, but the only serious Canadian plan produced called for a somewhat different course of action. Designed by Lieutenant Colonel James Buster Brown in 1921, Defense Scheme No. 1 advocated a series of rapid attacks into the United States by so-called flying columns. Under Brown's plan, these units would advance to the US on the day war broke out, go as far as they could and then retreat, destroying infrastructure as they went. The purpose of this was to buy time, until the British could come across the Atlantic to Canada's aid. However, from what we can tell, the British had no intention of deploying a major force to Canada. In the view of the Admiralty, it would put Britain into a fight where all advantages of time, distance and supply were on the side of the USA. 
For all intents and purposes, the Royal Navy wrote off the vast majority of Canada as having fallen and began its planning from that assumption. However, it is worth mentioning here that the British never produced a joined up inter-service war plan in the way the US did, so it's hard to say with real certainty what the British would or would not have done. Perhaps troops would have been sent across the Atlantic, but even if so, they would have likely found ports to be in American hands. This was because defense plan number one put very little emphasis on holding the Atlantic port, even- I mean, get Halifax. Go, go, go. it relied upon British troops entering through those very same ports to aid the Canadian army. Unsurprisingly, almost nobody within the Canadian military thought this was a sensible idea, and defense plan number one was very quickly dismissed. Brown's successor as Director of Military Operations and Intelligence, Andrew McNaughton, even ordered all copies of it to be burnt. On land then, it seems pretty likely that the US would have been able to overrun Canada, save perhaps for a few key bases on the east coast. How a war would progress from there is unclear, and seems not to have been very clear in the minds of those planning for it. Plan Red essentially hinged on the idea that in the long run America would be able to mobilise its superior resources and with the occupation of Canada eventually forced the British to make a favourable peace deal. The British planned to use its navy to just make life unpleasant for the Americans. A strong fleet would be sent across the Atlantic to be based at Bermuda, with smaller fleets in the Caribbean and at Halifax. From this position they would Look how far out Bermuda is. That, that's got to be over a thousand miles uh, off the coast of like Virginia. Or North Carolina. I had another question too. Oh yeah. Um, do you think that there is still some sort of plan today for like the US or for Canada or for Great Britain just to like have as a in case sort of thing? You know, I, I, if you're the leader of a nation and you're trying to protect all the citizens, then you have to take every possibility into account including a war against Canada uh, or Mexico today. And I'm wondering if there is like a war plan again. I'm, I'm picking Canada and Mexico because obviously those are the only two bordering nations. And I'm wondering if you think the U.S. still has like a war plan red sort of thing just for like a rainy day or just for precaution. Or is that just too insane to even bother coming up with a plan? Try to keep the American fleet bottled up. Unable to attack British shipping while enabling British cruiser forces to hurt the US's overseas trade. Neither side was keen to seek a major fleet engagement, so the strategy for both would be to try and make the war as unpleasant as possible for the other side, and essentially outlast them. The reality would be that without Canada as an active theatre, neither nation had a very effective way to deal a decisive blow to the other. The only way this might have changed, and this is what the Royal Navy feared more than anything, as if the US was able to gain a naval base in Western Europe and move its battlefleet across the Atlantic first. With the US fleet in place in Europe, the Royal Navy would find itself pinned down, with its trade routes open to being decimated by roving US cruisers. A serious blow to Britain's overseas trade would always be decisive, which is why the Royal Navy was always so anxious to maintain its superiority on the oceans during the 19th and early 20th centuries. Ultimately, we will of course never know the outcome of a war between 20 I mean, why not? Maybe it's too far. Isn't that the Azores right there? ...of centuries. Ultimately, we will of course never know the outcome of a war between the United States and British Iceland. Empire, as thankfully policymakers on both sides of the Atlantic knew just what a self-destructive folly it would have been. Instead, War Plan Red would be farmed away, and a decade later, Britain and America would find themselves allied once again, joining forces to help rid the world of fascism. We're buds. We're buddies. Oh, that's his Patreon tiers. That's cool. Captain Commander. Oh, uh, cool video. Don't you think about it, alright? Love y'all. Hope you're all doing well. Chin up if you're not. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. See you guys.